as I always do, it's not quite morning, so I, or not quite noon, so I can say good morning to you one last time. So good morning, and welcome to the uh, June, it is June, right? I lose track of the months. The June installment, the June of two, 2023 installment of the Reverend Jimmy Terry Preaching Series uh, here at the Garrett Auditorium uh, on the Baptist Memphis campus in Memphis. Uh, I'm being redundant too. So uh, we are glad you could join us. Uh, those of you who are here in the auditorium, also those who are joining us live all across the Baptist system today, uh, we are glad to have you with us. And I also want to make sure we, we say thank you to those of you who are watching later on uh, via Facebook. Uh, we, we have gotten to where we reach quite a few people uh, with our Facebook feed. So we're, we're grateful for that technology as well. Uh, we have a wonderful speaker that's going to join us and uh, bring God's word to us here in just a moment. After, uh, after I pray, uh, Dr. Stephen Threlkeld is going to come and introduce his pastor to us, and uh, then we'll, we'll get on with uh, It's All About Jesus, the Reverend Jimmy Terry Preaching Series. Please join with me as we pray. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day that you have given to us. Thank you for the blessings that we see that come straight from your hand every single day. We thank you, Lord, for every opportunity we have to hear your word preached and to be reminded that this life, it is all about Jesus. Help us, Lord, to have open hearts and open minds as we hear your word preached today. And I pray, Lord, for our speaker that you would put your very own words in his mouth. Lord, touch us with your word today and bless us now. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Dr. Steve, come on up. Thank you, Reverend Burke. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, my pastor, uh, George Robertson, today to our series. George uh, originally, I think, was born in Alabama, sure to think, and then moved to Georgia, where he uh, uh, took his baccalaureate degree from Covenant College in Lookout Mountain, his master's in divinity and Master in Theology degrees from Covenant Theological Seminary in St. Louis, and finally his Doctor of Philosophy degree in Historical and Theological Studies from Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. He's currently the Senior Pastor at Second Presbyterian Church uh, and has been uh, Pastor of First Presbyterian Church in Augusta, Georgia prior to that, and then initially, I guess, at Covenant Presbyterian Church in St. Louis. In St. Louis. He also serves as a lecturer and adjunct professor at Covenant Theological Seminary. He's married to Jackie, and we're very pleased is with us today, and they have a son, three daughters, and two sons-in-law, so entertaining holidays. I would say this, George Robertson is a man who lives and preaches the gospel in such a way as to be practical and attractive to others without compromising its truth. And I think we can all agree that that is an increasingly difficult path to walk in our current society. I think back to just last Sunday's uh, sermon where he was finishing up uh, on the book of Hosea in a series on the minor prophets, and he pointed out that we needed to live in such a way that people want what we have so that our God becomes contagious. And I don't know if anybody's ever thought that a preacher was speaking directly to them, but he had me at contagious, uh, for sure. <laughs> but you do that really only by asking for repentance and to be granted the knowledge that you're so encompassed by God's love that you can see your sin in the light that God sees it. And in so doing, you'll live your own life in gratitude for that grace and forgiveness as well. So it's a real pleasure for me to introduce Pastor George Robertson. George, welcome to Baptist, and I look forward to your comments. Well, I'm very humbled by that introduction, Steve. You're a great hero to me. Thank you for holding my hand through COVID as you did through for many in this community. You're a hero to us. And I want to thank uh, every member of the Baptist staff and community for being such a bright and healing light in our community. We are so grateful to you. And thank you to my friends, uh, Steve, Ann Reynolds, and Jason Little, and uh, I'm, I'm right at home here. Thank you for loving me, our family, so well. 
And I hope to encourage every one of you uh, listening today, I'm going to uh, share with you some, some thoughts from another minor prophet. Dr. Therkel referred to the minor prophets, and I'm preaching from one that has, I have not studied yet with Second Presbyterian, so keep it a secret until we get there. And uh, these minor prophets are these little Old Testament books that are tucked into the end of the Old Testament. I tell our people that it's, um, it's and somebody's talking to me up here. Hello. Um, but, uh, yeah, don't tell, tell them I'm not trying to be rude. I just can't talk to them right now. Um, but uh, these are, I say, these books are in the clean part of your Bible. These are the books that we don't really thumb a lot. We don't read a lot. We don't write the book much in the margins because they're kind of hard to understand at first. But once you kind of get the key to each book and unlock it, there's a lot of rich treasures as uh, there are in every part of God's Word. So I'm going to read today from a book called Habakkuk. It's only three chapters long. I'm not going to read the whole book, uh, but I'm going, to, I'm going to give you the whole story of it, even though we'll read just a portion of it. Let me put it in context this way. Habakkuk uh, was writing, he was prophesying about 600 years before Jesus was born. And he was right before great reforms came to the nation of Judah, which was the southern part of Israel at the time. They were a divided kingdom. Uh, and he was, he was pretty uh, discouraged uh, because uh, th those reforms were not coming. And he was so discouraged, he preached week after week to his people, and they just weren't responding. They were still worshiping their idols. They were neglecting the poor. They didn't care about uh, other people who had different needs. And he was complaining to God about it. And God answered him. And then he didn't like God, God's answer. That's, uh, we can feel that way, don't we? And so the question I want to ask today is, how do you doubt well? I'm not going to tell you not to doubt. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to from, from Habakkuk, relate from him God's word to us. How do you doubt but doubt well? Let me begin reading God's word, beginning Habakkuk chapter 1. <clears throat> the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet received. How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There's strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked, uh, him and the righteous, so that justice is perverted. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. God is now speaking back to Habakkuk. I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. I'm raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwelling places not their own. They are a feared and dreaded people. They are a law to themselves and promote their own honor. Then further down, here's Habakkuk's response to that. Oh Lord, are you not from everlasting, my God, my Holy One? We will not die, but O oh Lord, you have appointed them to execute judgment? O oh, rock, you have ordained them to punish? Your eyes are too poor, too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? You have made men like fish in the sea, like sea creatures that have no ruler. The wicked foe pulls all of them up with hooks. He catches them in his net. He gathers them in his dragnet, and so he rejoices, and he's glad. Later on, he says, I, I will stand at my watch. He's going to pout now. I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what God is going to say to me and what answer I will give to him as the complaint. And the Lord spoke again. 
write down the revelation, Habakkuk. Make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. See, he's puffed up. His desires are not upright. But the righteous will live by his faith. When I was pastoring in St. Louis, I did a wedding for um, a young couple who come, started coming to our church. And after the rehearsal, a man came up and, and uh, was engaging in conversation with me. And, and uh, I, I asked him if he was a Christian. He said, oh, no, God and I don't get along. I'm very angry, very angry at God. He has let me down. And uh, he wouldn't want to hear from me. I'll tell you what, if I were to talk to God, he would not want to hear from me. And I said, uh, you know, there are several people in the Bible just like you. And in fact, God inspired them to write down their doubts and their bitterness and their grief with God. And he put it in his Bible so that we would have a manuscript to express our doubts to him. He said, no, I don't think you have the same Bible. I said, well, here's one right here. And I'm going to give it to you to take with you. And uh, here's, uh, here's Psalm 44, here's Psalm 73, here's a whole book called Lamentations. And here is one of my favorites, this little book called Habakkuk. I said, you read Habakkuk and see if you can get angrier with God than this prophet. And God put his words in the Bible. Now, do you believe God is like that? Do you believe God is so loving and gracious and secure enough in his ego that he can allow you to express your greatest disappointment, your most profound doubts, your anger, your bitterness to him, and still love you and hold on to you? Well, Habakkuk shows you it's true. I want to give you three Three points to think about from this passage that uh, I would urge you to practice in your own life. Wherever you are with Christ today, I urge you to practice this in your life. Number one is pour out your doubts to God. Just pour them out. Because He wants to hear from you. And because He understands. You see, uh, I'll cut right to the chase. God knows what it is to suffer because he came in the flesh in Jesus Christ and in, in, uh, experienced every aspect of what it means to be a human being, especially the worst of it, even to death on the cross, the pains of hell, in order to make a substitute for our sin and make it possible for us to enter into heaven in his righteousness. Pour out your complaint to God. Here's what Habakkuk complains to God. He says, uh, first of all, why do you mistreat us? He, he didn't say, he didn't blame it on the Babylonians, the Syrians. See, what he's complaining about is, is that he's, he said to God, these people, my, my parishioners are not listening to me. When are they ever going to respond, repent, start following the Lord? And God says, well, I have an answer for that. Don't worry about it. And Habakkuk, in effect, says, well, tell me what the answer is. And, and God says, I, you wouldn't understand it if I explained it to you. You wouldn't like it either. And he says, no, come on. G give me the answer. I'm telling you, you're not going to understand it. And then God tells him, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send the Babylonians to whip up on the Assyrians and, the, and the, the, then the Babylonians. And, and Habakkuk's happy about that because he was afraid of the Assyrians. But then he said, and then beyond that, I'm going to discipline the, your parishioners with the Babylonians. And Habakkuk says, I don't understand. I don't like that answer. And God effectively said, I told you you wouldn't like it. I told you I tried to warn you. I don't like that. How can you be a God who would mistreat us? Those are bad people. He's not alone in saying that. Psalm 44. 
Just read it sometimes. Psalm 44, the psalmist is saying, you've rejected us, you've crushed us, you've betrayed us, you've abandoned us. You have, you've turned on us. We're like sheep to be slaughtered every day because of you. Habakkuk says that. The psalmists say that to God, and God doesn't strike them dead. Why do you mistreat us? And then he says, not only why do you mistreat us, but why have you abandoned me? There is no justice. I'll speed on through this point because it's right there in the text, but it basically says there's nothing reliable in this creation. I can't, tr I can't trust you for anything. You you've switched sides on us. Strong words to a holy and righteous God. Why does God not only allow him to say that, why does God, by the Spirit, write all, cause all these words to be written down, and he hands them to us, and he says, in effect, when you run out of words to complain to me with, take these and keep complaining. As long as you keep talking to me. When I was a little boy, I, I battled uh, very severe anxiety and depression. I came to Memphis often for, for tests. They thought I had a brain tumor or whatever, you know, because kids weren't supposed to be depressed or anxious in those days. And, and one, one, one occasion, we were in, I was in my living room with my dad. And I was weeping uncontrollably. I was just so worried about it. I couldn't put my finger on it. He couldn't calm me. And he said, you must, maybe you're angry about something. And so he said, I want you to get it out. And he rolled up a, a, a newspaper, the Commercial Appeal, which was right next to his Bible. I mean, you could, if, it wasn't in, if it wasn't in the Bible, the Commercial Appeal, it wasn't true. But he rolled up the Commercial Appeal, handed it to me, and he said, I want you to take out your anger on me. Just start hitting me with it. Daddy, I don't want to do that. No, just get it all out. So I gave him a whack on the head, you know. And then again, and again, and again, and again, and again, until I just wore out and collapsed in his arms. And he held me. That's what God is saying. Do this with me. I can take it. Get it out to me. Pour it out to me. And when you do, when you're in that place of refuge in my arms, then you can hear my promises. That's what happens with Habakkuk. He, he, he just finally wears out. And he says, I'm going to go over here and I'm going to sit down and you better come up with a good answer. And God does. He gives him promises. And now, now, those promises, Habakkuk is, is, is really working hard to keep them down because even while he's complaining, he knows them. You know, there's this, this little Latin phrase we use in theology uh, to describe what happens when you... Uh, when you come to belief while praying, lex orande, lex credendi, that, that as you pray, you, come, you can come to faith. Even while you're complaining in your prayers, you express, you know, complaining to God, you're effectively saying, I believe you're there. Habakkuk lets it slip out in, chapter, in verse 12 of chapter 1. My God, my Holy One, we will not die. I know, I know, I know we're going to be okay. But back at it. Why did you turn your back on me? And then eventually, he gets to these promises. Here's the spoiler alert. Here's how the whole book ends in chapter 3. He says, In wrath you, God, strode through the earth. In anger you threshed the nations. So you're going to get the Babylonians too. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. Immediately Israel, but ultimately the Lord Jesus. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. Yes, Babylon, but eventually the devil himself. You stripped him of head to toe with his own spear. You pierced his head when his warriors 
stormed out to scatter us. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go onto the heights for the director of music on the stringed instruments. I'm going to sing this. As you pour out your heart to God, you will begin to hear. As you're pouring out your heart to God with God's word, you will begin to hear and believe his promises. Habakkuk uh, found uh, these promises. He found that God is eternally faithful. He never fails. He found that he's sovereignly self-existent. He's stable. The, he's going to take care of us. The world is going to be sustained until Jesus comes back. And he is holy. He will never switch sides. There's a, an old, old book called Pilgrim's Progress about written in the 1600s by a Puritan who, who just, it was a symbolic of how the Christian life is. And, and uh, he imagines Christian stumbling and falling into a, a pit. And, and uh, this man named Help comes alongside him and he's thrashing in the, in the pit. It's, a, it's like quicksand. And as long as he's thrashing, he can He said, there's steps carved into the wall right over there. Just put your feet on those. And he walks out. And then Bunyan in a footnote says, the steps are the promises of God. The way to walk out of your doubt is yes, pour it out to God, but also stand on the promises he makes to you. He's faithful, he's holy, he's stable. Now here's the final thing, it's really quick. This is what, this is what Habakkuk does. When he pours out his heart to God, he names God's promises, he leaves it there. So if I'm a good preacher, I'm going to alliterate these points. You pour out your heart to God, you find the promises, and then you park it. When I drove up today, chaplain, your, your man was there. He identified me as a preacher. I don't know how in the world he picked me out as a preacher. And he said, park your car right here. I parked the car. I haven't thought about it again. It's in good hands. It's parked. When you pour out your heart to God and claim his promises, park it. Leave it with him. He's the faithful God who knows the plans he has for you to give you a hope and a future, to prosper you, not to harm you. And what is the... What is the proof of that? What is the, final, what is the final promise you can bank on? It's in this text, in this book. He has preserved his anointed one, that's Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to forgive us of our sins. If we put our sins on him, he gives us his righteousness. He was buried with those sins. He was raised to new life because God said he would do it and he did it in the resurrection. And, when he, and he did it because he justified our sins by his substitution. And if God can be trusted with the greatest need, the eternal nature, the, the eternal status of our soul, can he not be trusted with every other question in life? Every other concern, yes, he can. No matter what you don't understand about the problem of evil, why God allows suffering in the world, this much we can take comfort in. That God came to solve the problem of evil and suffering, ultimately, by becoming a victim to it himself and unwinding it gradually from the inside out. Right now, it's painful. Right now, your, your losses, your diagnoses, your family problems, they're overwhelming, but they're temporary. There's coming a day when they will end, and not only in your life, 
but they will end in the world. And God has guaranteed it for the death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and coming of his anointed one. The one who will live justified in harmony and fellowship with God is the one who, according to Habakkuk and Romans later, is the one who lives by faith. Righteousness is offered, a right relationship with God, the Heavenly Father, the kind, of, the kind of relationship by which you can cry out to a father and beat on his chest is offered to you, and it's free for the taking. You can't earn it or deserve it. Take it. Because the Father has loved us enough and proven it with the gift of his Son. If you want to know more about that good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, someone to pray with you, to walk with you through your pain, your doubts, this excellent chaplaincy staff at Baptist, uh, the Baptist system, there's a, there's a chaplain staff at every hospital. Please reach out to them. They wanted to make sure that I gave you that invitation from them. Please reach out to them. They will pray with you. They will point you to these promises in God's word, and it will be better. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, you promised that in this world there would be troubles, that there would be suffering that would crush us at times. But you also promised that uh, you would begin the process of unwinding that evil from the inside out by dying in our place. Help us to endure whatever is troubling us. Help us to endure whatever is afflicting us, whatever is causing pain, and driving us to this doubt. But, O oh Lord, never let us lose sight of you. Please keep us, hold us tightly and get us to the other side of trouble in this life or get us to the other side of this life where there will be no suffering, no tear, no disease. And then, Lord Jesus, we pray that you would come and come quickly and finally and forever solve the problem of suffering and pain and sin and evil in this world. Get a name for yourself in this place and in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Robertson, for sharing a, uh, a message from one of my favorite books of the Bible and a message I needed to hear today. I truly appreciate it. It's always the little books that have the biggest messages, I think. So uh, thank you for that. And uh, we hope, hope it was a blessing to all of you. So, good, so glad to see so many of you here with us today. And uh, we look forward to having you back again next month, always on the third Thursday of the month, the Reverend Jimmy Terry Preaching Series. God bless y'all. Have a great rest of the week.